All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Startup Studios podcast, where we interview people who build startups. How are you doing, Raj? Wait, is that what we're doing here? Wait, it's been a while, huh? We forgot. <laughs> I thought this was Clubhouse. Uh, it's good to see you, man. I'm super excited. Yeah. And, and our guest is going to be super fun. Yep. Um, housekeeping, though, Seth, I think mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. You know, Startup Studios, we've been working with quite a few people on the network side. And, and Seth and I want to make sure that we continue to move the ball forward. And you know, now we've also kind of been working with some crowdfunding people. So I'm pretty excited about the, how the platform's iterating. Um, so that's some, some cool stuff we'll be start bringing out hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of different moving parts. So things kind of also, it was fun because things kind of piled up all at once. I know Thrive is doing very well and stuff on my end is also thankfully moving up in the right direction. But yeah. um, we are fortunate enough that some of our existing guests, especially, for example, uh, our friend Young, who connected us with Lior Klisman. And we had a little trouble going back and forth because, to be honest, Raj and I decided we wanted to focus on our guests, like our friends first, not just him, but both of us, right? Um, but based on, so Young has been a close personal friend of ours for a while. He's a he's an advisor to Raj's company as well. And just the amount of stuff and the, the, um, the praise he had for Lior, it was pretty evident we had to make space. So Lior, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and spending this time with yeah, thanks for having me. And surely a shout out to Young who made this connection. Exactly. It only took a little bit back and forth, but we can blame Rouse for that. <laughs> exactly. Here's everybody. <laughs> and openly, right? It's going to be out on the internet forever. No, there's Maybe evidence. Raj. There's evidence. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We can always say it back. I mean, like, you see, we talked yeah. about It's because I'm brown, huh, Seth? That's what it is. So am I, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah. More than you, I'd say. Truth. Truth. Yeah. But um, actually, it would be awesome because usually we start off the episode with a little bit of an introduction about how we know the guests, right? So in this case, Lior, maybe if you want to get us started with how you met Young, um, I think that would kind of segue really well into our intro before we dive into your story. Yeah, that's a, a fun meetup how me and Young uh, met. We met through a, a networking group that we're both a part in called the uh, Operators Guild. Nice. Through one of their events in SF, uh, which we both attended, we had a mutual friend called Nim, and the sh the real shout out is to him who connected me to Young, who now I'm here. Look at that ripple effect, you know. Awesome, yeah. Uh, but we met me and him were the tallest people in the room. <laughs> was one of the shortest people in the room. So us all three standing automatically, two Gandalfs and Frodo with us. <laughs> we we have we have. The between us and now that's going to be public but you know that's awesome and then we hit it right off uh, as business owners as people who care about helping others as people who care about building businesses and just growing and we get super excited about it yeah. and just hashing it out and we started having monthly things which we turned to weekly things and uh, he's introduced me to other people who now I'm working with on building businesses. So, like I said, the ripple effect. And uh, I hope that I've done some for him as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. Soon. Yeah, we should ask him. But that's how me and I and Young know each other. That's awesome. Uh, well, we uh, uh, big shout out to him. He's been super helpful. I think that that's you know one of his kind of traits. He provides value as best as he can. So um that's awesome i guess maybe i can start off with in my introduction because i'm the more boring one raj is uh has a better background uh which will be a better segue so um from san jose born and raised kind of in the area um went to san jose state mechanical engineering got bit by the startup bug uh, that's actually how i met young uh young being from san jose state as well um Try to my hand at a bunch of different things. The one that actually worked was a performance marketing agency. This was like the first year when Facebook ads launched. We were one of the first API partners. So I was a founding employee at uh, Orion CKB, which ended up getting so sold to Elite SEM later on. Um, along the way, I was also, because I was doing some other startups, I realized I didn't know anything and I wanted more help. So um, ended up starting a meetup group with some friends that turned into an incubation space in downtown San Jose, ran that for like five years part time. Um, and that made me want to become a VC. So when the exit at Orion CKB happened, I just so happened to be visiting Pakistan, which is where my parents are from, and met some people who we ended up raising a small fund with. Um, <clears throat> 
where I was responsible for the accelerator program. We did $10,000 to $25,000 checks into very early stage, like first check companies. And then we had a separate seed fund for a hundred thousand to half a million dollars, where we did another like 23 investments. So oversaw 42 investments over four years that I was in Pakistan. These were like companies that we wanted to export out of uh, in Asia and the Middle East. Um, doing pretty well, some uh, two exits there. Uh, decided I didn't want to live in Pakistan anymore, wanted to move back. COVID happened. So I joined another startup called Delta Leaf Labs, where I was fortunate to become a co-founder. This was cannabis testing uh, that we created ourselves, sold ourselves online, and then did the analysis as well, like no third parties. So um, uh, that was kind of a marketplace for cannabis testing kits and plant testing kits that we built ourselves. Uh, grew that to about a half a million dollars a year in revenue in 2021. Last year, cannabis companies kind of took uh, a big beating with the crypto markets. Uh, some of our biggest companies went under and with them, a lot of our like kind of uh, revenue that was already booked. Um, so we ended up having to shut down, uh, couldn't survive. So that's actually how I met this doofus uh, over here who ended up uh, giving me a shot. I, I was fortunate enough to help with Thrive early on. And then now I'm with another startup uh, doing cloud efficiency AI. So yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Thanks for listening, Lior. <laughs> so Lior, I'm Raj. <clears throat> I, I'm a stripper professionally, and that's all it. <laughs> the good looking one. <laughs> no, I started. I started not as not as fun, not as much in the startup ecosystem. I, I'm a Goldman kid, so I started at Goldman. Uh, I'm a math, quant math, and econometrics kid. Just ran a derivatives hedge fund for about twelve years, so that was kind of my my belly wake, and then. Had an exit and then I uh, built a direct to consumer health and wellness company, sold that because it had a SaaS solution. So I pretended to, to get in the SaaS solution side and understand technology and startups and failed miserably until I met Seth on LinkedIn, which has been great. And then we realized, man, this is brutal. Um, it's really, really hard right now for a lot of people to get funding for any of that stuff. And especially if you don't, if you're not in the circle, uh, I'm a non-technical founder. I, I don't have MIT on my resume. I don't have Amazon on my resume. I don't have buzzwords like blockchain or web three or generative AI. And I'm like, great. I got knuckle tattoos. We good. You guys want to do this? So I've been ha having a lot of fun. You know, we've been building a SaaS solution that's for some dumbass reason it's working. Um, and I think the biggest, the biggest pull here was in startup studios is just founders for founders. And, I think uh, Seth and I are lucky enough to kind of leverage our network that we built over the past 20 years, each other. And, you know, we've stumbled a lot. I know I have, and the you know, best practices have kind of brought us to where we are. And that's how I met Young, you know, really understanding optimization, hyperscale, opening new geos, we're, we're scaling and what he did at Phil's Coffee. And he spoke very, very highly of you. So I'm extremely excited to get into it. Just, just a quick note on that, actually, like, so Young was one of our mentors at my incubation space. So like 10, 12 years ago, when he was working on his very first startup, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. But um, yeah, he's been he's been crushing it since. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I have to actually, Leor, like, now I really got to know, are we talking like six, seven over there? Like, what are we what are we talking about? Because you're the two tallest people in the room, you said. <laughs> Where are we at? Or he's six, five. <laughs> You're six. How's the air up there? Is it good? Is it better? Uh, short people. The air up there, apparently it's good, but you know what's not good? Getting your head hit every single day by different stuff. See, um, I'm telling you, it evens out. Like, I all oh, brain cells. It, it's those two extra little inches that yeah. make a difference, I'm telling you. I feel so bad for you. Wow. Well, more reason to spend uh, time outdoors. It's always going to be me. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Well, actually, you know, uh, Lior, thank you for listening to our TED Talks. Like, we would yeah. love, this episode is all about you. So without further ado, who is Lior Klisman? Uh, so first of all, it was nice hearing about uh, about you too and, uh, and getting even deeper. Uh, who am I? So I'm Lior from Israel originally, uh, born in a little town called Petah Tikva. It's a small city right outside of Tel, of Tel Aviv. Both of my parents uh, worked in security in the government, so pretty much what I had discussed over dinner every single freaking night when I was a kid was politics and security. Understood. The former could could not stand, so I can assure you both we're not speaking politics in this conversation. <laughs> The, the the latter became the, a small obsession: uh, security, computers, technology. Uh, getting my first computer at the age of what, like 
six, seven. That's when uh, when true uh, computers really came out, or where my parents could afford it. So to say, I came from the lower end of the socioeconomic classes. Uh, money was always an issue at home, uh, as I'm sure uh, some of you can relate, or maybe not. Who knows? Uh, when I got my first computer after everyone else pretty much had it, the first thing I did was kind of break it open and build it back apart. So it's like a hardware freak. I remember my parents freaking out. It's like we just spent all of our time <laughs> computer and you're thinking breaking it apart. But that became like an obsession, understanding technology. And you know, it was the dot-com boom, early 90s, uh, and kind of understanding, hey, what is the internet? What can it do? What does search mean? And all that fun stuff. What does scripting mean? And gaming was huge gamer nerd. Yeah. I've spent days inside the house. Uh, as much as I spent outside, I was uh, also a street kid. So a street kid and a computer nerd at the same time. Okay. Which, uh, which the makes... best balance. No, yeah. it's the best balance. Yeah. Playing outside and inside. It's the hard and soft. I love it. True. I didn't connect to one. So I got the street knowledge from being in the streets a lot. But I also got the technology and, you know, my own time kind of knowledge in a sense mm -hmm. as i said i come from the lower socioeconomic classes but i don't know how my parents did it but all their friends were in the higher socioeconomic classes and fairly okay. successful all of them were business owners so mom and pop shops mostly highly successful from laundry to tailoring to printing services everything wow. you can imagine and that struck with me i remember as a kid I spent days thinking, hey, why can they do it and succeed? And why can't my parents? And it was almost like a, a blame. Oh, we're not fortunate enough. We didn't deserve it. They do. We don't. Mm -hmm. They can buy. I can't. Mm -hmm. And all those things, which now connecting back, that that's the best thing that I've ever happened to me. You know? yeah. uh, my parents worked for the government and we lived uh, outside uh, of Israel twice. A very quick run to Singapore and and a much longer three and a half years in Brussels, in Belgium. That's where I studied in the International School of Brussels. First time as almost like an alien being put in a classroom with people from Africa, from Asia, from the state, mm -hmm. from Europe, from every single continent. And here's a little alien. No one speaks English. We're in an ESL class. <laughs> like literally, if you put people on Mars with hands and things like that, uh, that's where I learned really English. That's where I learned different cultures. That was, you know, coming from a, what you could say was a pretty primitive country. Again, technology wasn't there. Connectivity wasn't there. You still knew, like, America was the best, like, what Israel looked up for. You didn't really hear of other cultures so much. So all of a sudden, getting to know the different cultures, getting to know the smells, the, the different types of living, uh, going to their homes. And for me, food is a huge thing in life. I love food. I love cooking. So that's what I remember mostly as a kid, is those different homes that I went to and the smells of the cooking and the curiosity. And food brings people together. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, after I got back, uh, after we finished our uh, the Belgium uh, ride, got back to Israel, to Tel Aviv, went to high school, finished high school, as we all have to do. We went to the military. I was an intelligence. I was an intelligence operational officer, pretty much worked with security uh, systems and security solutions. Wow. Like you didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you say intelligence and security, of course, that makes sense. I had a lot of passion for it since, you know, as a little kid, I've been hearing about it, dealing with it. I uh, wanted to see how it's done on a much larger scale on, on a security of a, of a country, of a government, blah, blah, blah. Uh, once I finished my military, went to college as everybody's supposed to do a little quick one year in India. Uh, to 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 find myself uh to forget the the military part to explore the world uh wow was supposed to go to six months and travel to other countries stayed longer and just okay. Which, okay. well so i mean we we was uh breathed through quite a few different pieces i was about to but... say like let's just like you know i did just a quick stint in an ashram for like <laughs> And then the Dalai Lama was like, okay, you've been anointed as King Shit of Fuck Mountain. But like, that was just like on a Tuesday. I was <laughs> no, still that's, like that's pooping phenomenal. diapers at 17. You were like, relax, <laughs> man. Uh, no, and and I, I think this this also speaks to because I, I have a couple other uh friends who grew up in the in in uh, you know Israel as well and had to join the military. And and 
a lot of them have also kind of shifted, you know, maybe they don't speak about the politics. They don't speak about, you know, but um, the I haven't heard of anybody else actually taking the time or, you know, taking that spiritual kind of break uh, to find themselves or to really like figure out what they wanted to do. So I'd love to hone in a little more on that. So when, what age were you when uh, you joined the military? I'm, I'm blanking like uh, when you're, we all have mandatory, we go in 18, male 18. three years and females do two years. Okay, gotcha. So you're 20 years old at this time. You're you're done with high school. You're thinking about college. Um, so college you were thinking about like doing in Israel as well? Or were you, uh, So sorry, you were talking about Brussels. Um, Brussels was for, for middle school. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Gotcha. So... Well, Gotcha. So uh, at, you're 20 years old. You're still in Israel at this point. Like, are you thinking about studying locally? Or are you thinking about a pl- like tr- still traveling or were you of the mindset like I'm going to take a year off? I'll be honest, because I think it's important for people to. to yeah, hear. Absolutely. I, my dream was Caltech. My dream, you know, this, yeah. when you said Raj, the thing that you say, and I connected so much. So I don't have MIT or Caltech or all those on my resume. I just, I just don't. One, my family didn't have the funds to do it. And two, you can say, unfortunate, I'm not one of the world's genius to get a full scholarship. Yeah. Just not, that, that wasn't me. So quickly realizing that that's not me. And I mean, I could get accepted to different colleges at the state. Back then, the states didn't still call me. I, I thought only Europe was the only thing that I cared about mm. because of Belgium, because of many trips to to Europe. Europe was just something that I knew and at mm. the time was just looking for there. That's why I lived also in London and Sweden and Denmark and Germany. But I... I wanted to go study in Israel. I figured that, hey, this is my my home country. I could probably get in easier with the mm-hmm. funds that I have. I can work in things that I know. Mm-hmm. I was a barista for, for, for a good few years. I also created businesses when I was younger, kind of sold them. So I had some money to play with mm-hmm. and started college uh, and wanted to start college in Israel. Uh, okay. And not abroad for that specific uh, notion, and that's gotcha. when yeah, uh, those real realizations was okay. So it's weird that people don't say it. So I think the majority of Israelis, when they finish the military before they start studying, they travel, they do a backpacking trip, okay. wow. and that's usually either to Asia or mm-hmm. to South America. That's that's the two main because that's like real backpack backpacking gotcha. country that you can go for example you'll either do like thailand vietnam cambodia laos australia new zealand bali or you'll do like india pakistan mm-hmm. and all all those surrounding wow. or you'll go to like brazil argentina bolivia peru colombia and all those okay. so i think many of many if not the majority of israelis do go to that spiritual journey to kind of put a break from our upbringing military being a product of a military for the good and bad of it to becoming fully your own independent and what's life i think it's also it sounds a bad but i think it's also there's something profound in it because much more an adult and independent to make that correct decisions of what you want to study not the the 18 year old that just finished high school and and he's like push yeah like, hey, oh it's it's so fast right you have like two right. three months to plan exactly what you want to do and exactly. if you don't have a head start either but i don't know what the uh, middle school or high school process was in israel but um you know over here and even in pakistan with the british system that we had it was all just like hey everything's just layered and you don't have time to think um so so at this point you're you're 20 years old you're you're done with military service you did your first year in uh let's say a local university over there uh, uh, it, it was more interesting than, than that so i didn't even do a year so i started i went to study i wanted to study business uh, as you can imagine by now i mean business is all i cared about creating business running business and doing my own thing uh, I knew I was not meant to be an employee uh, and I'm saying it pr- proudly for myself and myself only and does not mean that others should follow the same route but we're in a founder show so we're going to talk about exactly. transparency uh, I, I went to study business and quickly realized it's not it's a waste of my time for me back in that time uh, what I did is drop out after three months and for the pa- the rest of the nine months of that year, I monitored the classes that I actually 
cared about. So strategy, economy, budgeting, and things or ledger systems and things that I actually cared about that I'm uh, that I thought at the time that I'm going to utilize. Eighty percent I didn't need to utilize, but it interests me. Yeah. And then uh, I also went to do like two certificates in the IT space. I still were attached to the IT and security. Wanted to maybe be an engineer. Couldn't kind of figure out what I wanted in between. Uh, and that's where I kind of made the hump to the U.S. Uh, I had a friend who lived in New York, uh, came to visit. Nice. And what, what time? Like what timeline is this? Is this like late '90s, early 2000s, or? No, so the move to New York happened in 2009. Okay, nice. Yeah. Okay, so so that's probably a big jump, but um, I, I'd love to hear about this uh, this spiritual trip a little more. So um, was, like what what timeline was this when you actually went to India? 2006, 2007. Okay, gotcha. Nice. So and and what where did you go? What like did you plan it out with some people? Because at the time, uh, a, traveling was so. Hard. 20 2007 2008 yeah no so so early so i mean to where it wasn't as easy to plan you know an entire country's trips on the internet um like what what was your mindset going into it you mentioned that i think uh you had planned six months initially and then to travel elsewhere but then you stayed um where did you go into india first and then what happened from there so the decision to go to India was because two of my best friends have been there already before and said amazing things to it. So it was kind of, and I had two other friends that wanted to go. So all of us kind of wanted to go. So it, it made sense. I was thinking about in the beginning was, okay, we'll do India and then I'll go to Thailand and Nepal. So India, Nepal, Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea was to go there and, and do backpacking, do something I've never done before in a place I've never done before and start from south. So land in Bombay, mm. start, go down south and then go all the way up. Wow. So we started in Bombay. We went down after Bombay two first days, which was the two days I can tell, you know, two hours just story on those two, two days alone of <laughs> coming as a, as a 20 years old to both. <laughs> with not too much uh, understanding where I'm going to. Nice. But from there, we went to Goa, and then we went to Karnakara and Kerala, and then went up again to Mumbai, and then Rajasthan, and then Himanchal Pradesh, and Leh, and so forth. So that's, and every place I thought I'm going to be two, three weeks, and it being two, three months. Nice. Uh, and that's how you get to a year quite fast. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And you guys probably got the, or did rickshaws, huh, in between. Yes, so yeah. the rickshaws, night buses, night trains, and uh, everything in between. Some motorcycles, mm -hmm. like the good Enfield, which I miss. Nice. Now, there, there are a couple of friends of mine uh, who were like, big in the startup space early on. Um, they actually took part in a rickshaw race all around India, which I think was around, like I think, 2008, 2009 period. Um, but something happened. They, they had to... Like they had to cut the race short or something, but they still had a good time. Uh, yeah, just, it was a rickshaw yeah. race around India. Like, mm -hmm. I, that's insanity. I, I, that has to stop after like a day. I, hey, I mean, every day, right? A new place. That sounds and, amazing. Yeah. yeah like, exactly. Also a dumpster fire at the same time in a great way, in an amazing way. A gumball 3000. Like, yeah, exactly. So it's a gumball race. <laughs> yeah. oh, With rickshaws. Awesome. Yeah. And so when when you're in, so you said you spent like a few months in each spot or in each like kind of region. What was that like? Like, were these hotels that you were staying at? Were these like just people that you interacted with? Were you backpack like hotel not only hustling? That, yeah, it, not only that. Like, if you so I traveled with my brother for almost two years. We just did the world, and we learned so much. If you learn so much from your parents at night you know, hey, listen, politics, nope, and security, taking apart the phone, you obviously learned somewhere else. Did it scratch a curiosity itch when you're like, hey, I'm in I'm in Croatia right now, the black holes, you know, the three black cats hostel. Man, but this, this isn't, this, that, that's not efficient. That's not efficient. It can be more efficient if you do it X, Y, and Z ways. Like, did you always have that perpetual, like, I'm an entrepreneur? Yes. 
And and even there, we try to do some things like make Ex- yeah, come on, come on. What did you what did you fuck up? What did you fuck up? so we so we said strip no we did we, we try to a bunch of things, but to to first to your question, Saif, it's the reason that we stayed in each place was because of what Raj said. Things just turned to be. We went to a place like Goa, for example, and we yeah. always stayed in guest houses. So with other people, it wasn't like the fancy hotels. Who cared about it? We wanted, yeah. you know, to be with like peasants. We wanted to live as you live. It, it's not about who cared about luxury. I didn't come from luxury, so it's not like I needed that or anything like that. Yes. And. Every day, what was beautiful in India in general and great for my entrepreneurship journey, that there wasn't plans. Yeah. We weren't in a city that you make plans that let's go this, yeah. let's go X, Y, and Z. We needed to make our own plans every day and be really curious and creative with what we want to do. So one day, for example, we'll took a motorcycle and we'll drive to a place that they've never seen a white person before because we're interested to see a town that not many tourists go to. And wow, the interactions. Sorry, and- sorry, sorry. A six five white dude. <laughs> yeah, like let's like let's call a spade a spade here. Yeah. A six four w- walks in and with, okay. uh, with other, you know, not so little people as well. And everybody in the town comes to us. Everyone. I remember every single person that's us came to her. And just the interactions, the humility, the, the sense of presence of being here, of that this world is so much materialistic, yet in some places like that, it just didn't hit yet, you know? And I and I hope it always stays like this. Right. Like there's just a sense of community, of understanding, of curiosity, because everyone was curious. Why did we? Why did we choose to come there? You know, not many people knew English because it wasn't a town that sees a lot of tourists, so people don't have a real reason to study English. But the ones that did were really curious to know why, and and we just explained there there was no why. We looked, yeah. we thought, we we took action. Yeah. It's what we do in business, isn't it? We we make the hey, Leor Leor say it again. Just <laughs> find a need, fill a need. Business is just being busy. Like you just nailed it. You absolutely yeah. nailed it. it. It is what it was. And that's how we had so much fun. And the time just passed by. And every time we were like, why did we make a plan to be here two weeks? Let's just see how it goes. And we make our own reality and we make our own future. And we decide if we feel good, we stay. If we don't feel good, we move. That's the beauty of act true freedom. Uh-huh. One that I haven't experienced in the past 16 years. Yeah, since the, doing that. But that was a true sense of the first time in my life of true freedom. I'm the master of my own decisions. I can say yes. I can say no. I take action. I don't. Whatever it is, it's up to me. I'm in the driver's seat. Uh, so I think it was exponentially to me. And you ask Raj. So we saw that there wasn't many parties. We liked parties back then when we were a kid. We liked electronic m- music. And we saw that there is no parties. For all the years that parties happening all over in India, for some reason, the season that we went, there wasn't much happening. Uh. <laughs> so the cool thing was from the world, okay, how can I have a sound system that I can travel portals? So the first two weeks we went to find, like in this weird town, sound system that we can carry it with us the entire trip and carry <laughs> it with us a sound system the entire trip so we can make like guest house parties and yeah. things like that for other people because I care about, I love connecting people and in, being investing. People is my favorite thing in the world and I love mm-hmm. cultures. So that brought people together. And then when we saw, okay, it's bringing people together, how can we actually start? making it a business because we like making businesses let's we went up north and then we decided to do a huge party like a 300 people person party we went to get the sound system we talked to this police and we brought this (laughs) who not did we not buy there and you know you go to india back in those days like i was a kid i felt like a millionaire even though i was poor in my i felt like a millionaire so it's like there is a word in india that says everything is And it's, it's true. Uh, Everything yeah. is possible. Yep. So we did a party. And it was huge. And then we wanted to do like a whole, like it was another uh, like celebration for an Israeli uh, holiday. I forget what it was. And then we brought, we had like a thousand people coming, but then we had the police coming in and interfering <laughs> and like the, 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 the federal police because they heard of people. So it was an interesting mm. uh, travel that I've learned so much about my entrepreneurship kicked in there my curiosity kicked in there my presence my freedom uh, so he, true 
uh, a pivotal time in my life from separating okay upbringing to now the adulthood wow i that was profound man like That's what i don't think say like i don't know <laughs> And you're still I'm, like what 21 at this Yeah, stage? like fuck like, you. Like I was on my swing set in my backyard. Like yeah. I could go really high on my swings though, Leo. Like I, I could kick my legs <laughs> really high and hey, I was just focused on turning 21 so I could finally go to the bar. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, no, that's that's amazing. Um okay, so then what happened? <laughs> and then yeah. Uh, so I guess we are now after after like the college dropout thing, monitoring, and moving to the U.S. Yeah, there we go. So right after India is when you moved to New York. No, no, I came back to to Israel, and then did some stints in uh, Sweden, England, yeah. Norway, Germany uh, for the. Yeah, next... No, I know. I did too. I, I did mean... my stint in Sweden, and then I did Germany too. I was like, oh man, I'm gonna go to Germany and just fucking you know, do some stuff. Define like stints, man. Yeah, like for me, I've ever heard like, like two, oh, three days. You know, I don't know, it's it's I'm not proud of it, but I went to those countries to work, whether if it was, and you'll find it funny because I sold like yeah. flying helicopters in Mall. Oh. I okay. sold oil paintings door to door. Yeah. I sold oil paintings in the middle of the street. Things I'm not so proud of, but I did what I needed to do to stay work for three, three-ish months, three, four months, and then travel for another two, three across wow. the countries or stay in them. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and Lior, like, I'd like to just, <laughs> just take a pause here, Seth and Lior, like, one of the most amazing founders I've ever met. She just raised 16 million bucks super on her Series A, and she was working at Subway. She was working at Subway and everyone's like, well, like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm making it work. And mm -hmm. I just, you got to love like your audience right now. Lior is like, yeah, motherfucker. I remember selling Mary Kay door to door during the day. Cause at night I was working on my, my, my startup. So like, yeah. that's the reality. Like, let's just be honest. I still, I still train people because I know they're a funnel into my, my company, but I want to get, I want to get the dirt. I want to understand user friction. I want to understand user like, you know, trials and tribulations. Like it's just continuous feedback, customer feedback. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is. So it, it, it's not that I not proud. I'm very proud of that. I did it and chose to do it and went through it. Some of what I sold in the price that I sold them, I'm less proud of. <laughs> That's what I meant. Uh, but you, know, you, you got to do what you got to do, especially, right. especially as immigrants, especially as not, not coming from a financial background, stability, and you need to do it yourself. So I never took no as an answer. If I wanted to visit something, I would be willing to go there. I'll work. I'll do what I need. Even if I need to wash fucking dishes, it doesn't matter what I need to do. I'll do it because being in the place and experiencing the place is actually, for me, was more meaningful than just going as a tourist to this place. I learned... Of course place that I worked that I worked in so much more about the place until today it took me about six and a half years in New York to see the Empire State Building it took me I've been in California in San Francisco nine years swear to God only this year I did the ferry for the first time I still haven't seen Lombard Street like <laughs> wow still haven't been there yeah because care what tourists do i care about what locals do and how locals live in the cities that they live in and what do they eat and how do they live and how do they sleep and what's their struggles and what's their successes so it all led from that of being in it and being in a part of you all of a sudden becoming in one's economy like i went to oslo and lived there all of a sudden i understood how oslo works show me a tourist that go for a week and understand how oslo works <laughs> and those are the, the experiences that I wanted to have because I knew that mm -hmm. I can't have I can't have them in Israel. Mm -hmm. We're still not big in Israel. You, we wouldn't get international crowd. I couldn't get it. Now I lived in other places as a kid, so I'm so used to international crowd. I'm actually less used to just Israelis. Mm -hmm. so for me, it kind of was. I didn't even need to put any thought. I need to be outside. Wow. For me myself. <laughs> so. No, so, sorry to cut you off, but uh, um, before we dive into this perspective a little more, right? Because most of the guests that we've had are all uh, also immigrants or first generation Americans or, you know, kids of, of immigrants. And one thing that we've all kind of alluded to is that our parents were very instrumental in kind of guiding us in our path. You said that your parents were both in the security field, working for the government and like, did they encourage you throughout 
all these different like random things? Was it difficult? Like you mentioned, obviously they were upset that you tore apart the computer first time you got one, but otherwise, like how was that? How did that play into all of this? I can definitely say, you know, a lot of people use it, but I don't see it as a gish. And my mom is my biggest superhero. I would not be where I am today if not my mother. I, I, I really wouldn't. Uh, mm-hmm. And I know, love my dad to death as well, but he wasn't the entrepreneurial rod. Not that my mom was, but... And no to your question. No, I think family are the biggest dream killers. I really mm-hmm. educate that to first-time founder that I speak. I think... So- and it's not because they don't want us to succeed. It's because no, they, it's they love you so much. They want you to have the security. They want to know that you're safe. They want you to be in a stable job in their mind. Yeah. So it doesn't come from a bad place. It comes from a lot of love. She hated everything I did. Absolutely. Yeah. From selling pretzels at, outside of, st- of football stadium at 12 to selling uh, T-shirts at 15 and gloriously failing to moving to all these countries and working. Her son will need to go and work somewhere else. I was an only child to my mom and oh, I had two other kids from a previous marriage. Okay. Older. So for my mom, it was always hard. And then mm-hmm. to move to the States and leave her mm-hmm. and starting your own businesses and not having the security. No, it drove her absolutely nuts. Yeah. But to her credit that she never distracted put a stop on me. She always supported as much as she gave me crap for it. She also always knew how to say the good word to know it's like, if that makes you happy, do it. So it was kind of the both having her scarcity and having her patterns and traumas in life and pushing them onto me and projecting them because that's the conditioning that we all get from our parents and we have it as well that we try to heal and you know we're getting woohoo now but uh, for them no they, they, they didn't come natural to them. Yeah. Uh, I, no, think I appreciate you. A lot of her friends made it easier for her explaining how they started their business and that I needed to do it. Uh... For my life. Wow. So I think maybe her community made it easier for her to mm-hmm. guess. I don't know as I wasn't there, but yeah. that's what I think uh, that it was. But yeah, I, that's, that's everything awesome. I have, it was because of her, because of not giving up on me. Yeah. And I wasn't the easiest of, uh, of child or the easiest or the best student. Yeah, uh, but like, but but also lean into that. Let's, just, let's be honest for mom. It's like, cool, she could have preconceived notions. And let's just say I'm going to 100% project here. Let's just say she's in her 50s or 60s. And then her child is like, hey, I want to do X, Y, and Z. She takes a step back from being ingrained in the cast that's being died for 60 years or 50 years and being like, hold on. Maybe I can talk to somebody to learn and be mm-hmm. better and not kibosh that. Yeah, I might not fund their thought process, but like if they're at least like, hey, tell me about this and tell me if it makes you happy. That's, holy shit, that's a mountain to climb. That is a mountain. Of, and 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 let's don't even add being a female, being generationally like, hey, you have to do this. You have to be a lawyer, if it's, you know, a doctor or this. Like, that's amazing. And okay. and also, Lior, like you said, like, I'd say 70, shit, I'll bump up to 80 to, to 90% of founders don't have that. They just don't. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's super cool. Mom, shout out to you. <laughs> yeah, to mom. She, she is the best <laughs> no that's that's amazing and thank you for sharing that that perspective with us um so to bring it back hold on hold on the perspective also because because leo because you said like woo woo like seth and i are very very clear about hey listen the mental juxtaposition between the physical is very very real we we are so here we manifest it physically if if we think we're imposters, we will execute as imposters. Absolutely. If we get this small seed in our head, if we're doing something we've never done, founders can get derailed by by a, a hashtag, by an Instagram post, by by anything. Imagine so like, fragile, right? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, when I work with a founder, the first book I have them read before any business book is The Four Agreement by Don Miguel Ruiz, because I think that that book means so much more to business and for your own. Hold self. on, hold on. What is it? We yes. got to put this somewhere. Yeah. What yeah. was it? The Four Agreements uh, by Don Miguel Ruiz, and all yeah. of his books are amazing. And that's the first one. I completely agree with you, Raj, that in the workplace that we are now on, and I'm happy to talk about it more later on, but the, the workplace that we are now living and this day and age, mindfulness in the organizations yeah. is really important. Yeah. For founders exploring their personal side and yeah. their personal growth is more important 
than their business coaching. Yeah. So, out of it and it's something that i've done in my life and my own personal pilgrimage as i call it and i highly recommend and i encourage people to do it for their own because if you want to be a true making change if you want to true be there for others if you want to be a true leader working first on yourself and coping with yourself in your own mirror before you give others advice is at most important important and you said it the best if you're if you're doing impostering to yourself you're going to do impostering it as you come across mm-hmm. or you know go think consumed you i call them the mask we put on so many masks you forgot you put them to begin with it's so hard to strip them after you put so many of them on yeah wow now that's the that's cool man and and thanks for mentioning the book uh, we'll definitely check it out but um all right so uh, go ahead raj no it's just like the masks were so interesting but the masks can also be a tool, correct, Lior? Like, hmm, that's an interesting kind of back and forth with yourself. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a fragility, that's right? That. Like, you can go lean either direction. Sorry. There is um, a reason that there is yin and yang because there is balance in everything. And there is a balance. We can put masks. Sometimes we are needed to put yeah. some masks. The, yeah. the thing is, do we let that mask consume us or do we remember that we put it on and we can strip it at any time? That's the word. What are you doing? You're a robot? <laughs> this no, this because... is like the our favorite part of, of this like gig is just learning and soaking. And no, it, and it just takes me back to your childhood of being six and breaking open the thing. But then, so my whole thing was like my son and myself, like physics and philosophy. You have the hard and you have the soft and you, you're bridging them so well. And I think that's, probably what made you wildly successful is like you don't have a burden of knowledge and you talk about how you kind of checked out at night for your dinners well it was the same way five physicians in my family and i say this stupid cliche to seth and seth's like oh he's doing the dog thing again i know i know <laughs> like the dog throws up and like all of like my mom my dad my sister and brother like oh he's got a scheme of all it's like no he ate his own poop he literally <laughs> ate his own poop and he's throwing up his poop there's no diagnosis. There's no, like, I understand your hammer. I get it, physician. So I think that's, I mean, I'm excited to hear about the rest, but I, I'll, I'll venture guess that's what was a foundation for your being so successful. And, and, you know, and it's a lot of work and it wasn't always like that. <laughs> I had a lot of learning. It, I, I want to, you know, the people that hear us, it doesn't come naturally to anybody. It's like a new muscle that we have yeah. to work and exercise and, you know, and stay dedicated to it because you can easily go back to those all same old things that we're all used to mm-hmm. and, and playing that and not being aware. It's really like going to the gym every day. It's the same thing. And I rem- remind myself that because it's sometimes we all have our, you know, breakdowns that you go and it doesn't, ah, oh, like oh, all the work that I did doesn't feel, I'm not connected to myself and not this and that. But it's it's that work. It's to continuously remind you. That's why I believe that the Four Agreement is such a profound book. I read it every quarter just to remind myself, and I remember it. I can I could probably read the entire book by now. Just saying, yeah. it's still a good reminder. It's like okay, there there is things that are important and things that we can implement them. You just live a happier life. And succeeding in a business doesn't mean happier life. Let's put mm-hmm. that straight up. Yeah. So Leo, wow. then I'm going to have to ask, because I know Seth's going to keep going. And I love it. But we also want to trade some tactical stuff as well. So I, I love everything you just said and understanding the dichotomy of like, hey, listen, it's not life or death, even though it's life or death. Yeah, exactly. What were some of the tools you used? You, you Obviously, you read. Um, I'll venture, I guess, got your eight hours of sleep. You drank your milk. Like, like truly, though, like meditating removing kind of the emotional quotient that you just you live into because we know it's an up it's a dumpster fire until series a and probably still into like ipo or exit but was there something that you're like okay cool when i woke up in the morning i did and it doesn't have to be a routine but did, could you pinpoint like one or two things that you're like man this is bringing me back to a little bit of reality as a founder yeah because we always say it's the two things it's so lonely it is it's, so lonely and you get this echo chamber of just fuck i suck oh you do and i call it the desert and it's the the roller coaster of being an entrepreneur or founder one desert. day 
top of the mountain the other day you're in the bottom of the hill and you just don't understand how you're ever going to climb so and everybody feel it it's inevitable you need to feel it i think it's a part of the journey serial founders get co uh, cope with it much much better than new founders so now when i do what i do i'm much more adaptive to it and not letting it get to me but in the early days it wasn't and i think the the couple of more most important things that i've had is mentors one mm. and i think everybody needs mentors and my you know the more open you get with your mentor because you said it best rush it is lonely but no one can help you if you don't share what keep what does keep you up at night what's really under there it's not oh my go to market is unsuccessful and we can't find product market fit it's much much more deeper than that and a lot of times when i speak to founders i realize that their personal stuff that they couldn't make friends or don't have anybody to take a hike with or don't feel a sense of belonging is what's killing them it's not the business but they bring it every day to the business so inevitably it's killing the business as well mm -hmm. so i think it's for hold people on, i gotta validate here because Leo, you just god seth i hate that you bring all these fucking great people on here <laughs> so a big thing for me when uh, so silicon valley bank happened yeah. And we got fought and we were moving over to another company, another bank. And they was a fraud thing. Cause like, Oh, you came from here. And one of my LPs was like, Hey, like he was like, as invested as I said, Hey, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? How can I help? And I didn't want to let him down. I didn't want to tell him, Hey man, I fucked up. We have a, we have a hang up here. Cause it was like daddy issues. It was literally like, I want you to be proud of me. You're an LP. We were like, I wasted like seven weeks. I literally wasted seven weeks. And then I, and then I came and I told him, he was like, you're supposed to do this, you idiot. Like you're supposed to fuck up and then ask me, why did you waste seven weeks? And I wasted seven weeks, kid. I did. I did because I projected something from my insecurity that manifested into reality. Super frustrating. And one of the agreements in that book is don't assume anything. And I really try to live it because once we assume things is when we make usually mistakes. You cannot assume something that's yours. And the more you open up, because that person told you very simply, what do you need? And if you told them exactly what it is you need, you'll probably have that that same day. But in the end, you heard it as like, he's <laughs> testing me. My ego is testing me. I don't want to tell him what I need because I look weak in front of them. But that's not the way to overcome the pattern, to overcome our, the true obstacles of being a founder. And that's what the mentors are for. That's what friends are for also. Mm -hmm. Like I've utilized my friend. I came to my friends in the early days and I tell them, you're going to sit here and you're going to hear me vent for a freaking hour. And I don't want to hear a single word. Because, you know, and I'm thinking about this Kevin Hart's kid that he talks about like the best friend. Because as he said, if you're if you're in contract with me as the best friend, your shit is my shit. My shit is mm. so true. And sometimes we don't even have that conversation with our best friends. It becomes so shallow. We don't tell them, hey, we can't sleep at night because X and Y is because we think that they don't have time for us and they have their own problems and they don't, it will be so boring for them. But that's what true friendship is for. And if you can't do it, that, that person is not a true what i call a true friend so it's the mentors it's the true friends and being honest about it and also i think the most important is okay being comfortable to be uncomfortable understanding that there's going to be shitty times yeah. and the perseverance that's what when people ask me what's the most important thing you can think of for entrepreneurs is perseverance it's really because there's so much rejection there's so much obstacles there's obviously a lot of successes around the way even many small successes but the perseverance is to not to take no for an answer to continue that no one can move you from your center is something that i was taught that i started cultivating with myself uh, that was super important to me in the early days not giving up and doing the groundwork really going out there knocking on doors it was easy for me because i literally had to knock on doors in the past connecting the dots raj to what we said earlier but, you know, connect, I see founders and sometimes we'll talk about immigrant founders for a second. I see them coming in here and not going to enough networking groups and not going to mm -hmm. enough. And not going. How do you want to create clients by just cold reach out? Mm -hmm. So it's the groundwork and the footwork habit that I call that's extremely important. So mentors, perseverance and networking. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually, um, you know, at the mentor angle, right? So. 
a lot of people, including myself and Raj, like there are people who, for example, I can speak for myself. I worked in the past. There were colleagues of mine. In some cases, they were on the board, different startups, you know, people who I built a relationship with, but who I don't really feel like I can just call up and, you know, maybe I'm I'm on the lookout for new mentors. How did you go about like picking and choosing yours? I feel like that is a question that comes up quite often. It comes up a lot and I get that as well. So it's a great question. And I think it's our ego is what stops us most of the time because people want to help people. People want to help people. And I'm willing to put my money on it every single time. People don't know how to ask the right things that they want. So people ask, hey, do you know anybody? Such an open question. Nobody knows anybody. So I challenge them, be more specific with your ask. Exactly what it is that you need. So damn it. My dad told me every day of my life, like 20 years, life rewards specific asks. Yes. And he stopped there. Life rewards specific asks. Because general asks get you nowhere. So you don't go to somebody who's like, can you be my mentor? That's not the way to go. No one wants to be somebody's mentor just for the sake of being a mentor. So it comes from, I've researched people that I cared about, that I looked up for. I bother them in emails, even if they don't. And I ask them to, to help because I need this and this. And I follow them for a long time that they've done similar things. And I would love to tap into their knowledge and that specific ask. Let me take, let me invite you to a lunch and I want to ask you X, Y, and Z. And from other people, I've asked some of my clients in the past that I looked up for is like to their founders, like, do you mind if we talk once a month and I can share with you some of my struggles? And if I can help you, you can share the same, but it's really like I, I need somebody and I look up to. And once you ask and be really authentic about it, people usually don't say no. And if they tell you no, they'll give you a great reason that will satisfy you, that you don't think that they're just brushing you off because mm-hmm. you came to the authentic, you said your truth. And it also didn't move you because you didn't expect a yes. You know, in the first year of, of running my first business, not sentence, my previous one that I started in New York, I've reached all my, the heroes that I can think of. Sir Richard Branson, Bill Gates, J- Bessels, all of them. I developed an email, sent them all. I called it 15 minutes to change a life. I remember that was the top, the subject. Only Richard Branson assistant reached out, said, oh, that was a wonderful one, but he's too busy to meet. All the others didn't even read. But I felt good because I did something that I wanted to do, and I didn't stop myself because of being scared. I didn't care if they answer or not. I just did it. And the same thing I did, and then I understood, okay, I'm going to the top of the top. They probably don't want to talk to me. Let's go three, four levels down. And those people did talk to me. I've reached, for example, I remember VPs of Cisco Meraki or VPs in Okta or Apple. I think people talk. Mm-hmm. Wow. People are too shy to say what they need. And more problematically, once they do get the meeting, they're not authentic about what their struggles is. And they try to make it, you know, you want somebody to mentor you and then you come to the meeting and you tell them everything is great. Then why the hell did you want to meet? Mm. Because something is not great. The fact that you're looking for a mentor, something is not great. And it doesn't, if if everything is great, then something is very bad. Because never it is in a business, everything is great. It just doesn't exist. Not in life and not in business. Same thing. In in, in my opinion, yeah. (laughs) No, again, profound kind of uh, perspective there. Now, like, Uh Leo, I love you. (laughs) I can also write some fucking fortune cookies. How did you use this? No, I mean, I love it. And this dickhead, Seth actually sat me down and he gave me a, when we were looking at his co-founders, he, he gave me like a 50 questionnaire. Like he truly wanted to talk about my psyche. And I was like, like, and he kept harping on it. He kept harping on it. He kept harping. On it. I was like, Hey, we need to go over this founder questionnaire. I was like, Hey, F you, like, what does it matter? But it was literally like one of the best questions I saw was like, when you get stressed out, how do you operate? If I have a personal conundrum in my life and I want to pretend as a founder that I can like I can stylo it from my work, it's a lie. It's a lie. And so like it really hit me like, man, when I when I'm in a lull, when I'm in a funk and I'm super stressed out, do I not answer my email for three days because like I don't want to talk to people? But you can't do that as a founder. So then who can be that person to pick up the slack? Like mm-hmm. it's hard. And I 
honestly, romantically agree with everything that you're saying. Could you make it a little bit more real world? Like in your businesses and all like, and, and I'm going to be terrible right now. So like gravity payments. I don't know if you, do you remember gravity payments randomly? He's a guy, he's a CEO and the founder who bumped everybody's salary up to 70 grand. He's like, even the lowest, lowest, lowest person, first person in the door, 70 grand. And like, it, it made a big Delta and it was great. And everyone like, he was a panacea, Dan Price is the panacea. And then he like got ousted because of like sexual harassment in his own company. You know what I'm trying to say? Like there's all this virtue signaling and, and, and self-righteousness that comes, but like, it seems like you applied it in your successes as well. And, and I can tell you first, I don't, you know, fully agree that founders are very lonely because I don't believe in a solo founder. I think that founders need a co-founder. So one is the relationship that you have with your co-founder, whether it's your CTO or a COO, or whatever title that person, are you honest with the struggles? Me and my partners have talked about the struggles and we never judged each other. Yes, sometimes there were judges and we went through fights and sometimes you'll have it as well, yeah? Mm-hmm. And you ask, hey, what do you do real world when you have a stress? I went out, I screened I've practiced MMA for the past six years, and that helped me release steam, meditation, yoga, exercises, running outside. That's real world stuff. And it sounds like a, like a fortune cookie as well. Why am I saying it? Because when people told that to me, my mentors in the beginning, I told them you're fortune cooking me until I started implementing the same thing that I've heard over and over again that actually made help. I was like, yoga is going to help me with business, <laughs> MMA. Yeah, they actually do. So I think those are and being open to what's really there for you. My gratitude journal every morning. Because yep. shit's going to suck today. It's going to suck. Uh, there's going to be a, a an inventory van that gets in a wreck and doesn't get to the shop in time. There's going to be an employee who did, did something stupid. Like, I totally get it. So, yeah. And I do want to clarify for the people who are here and because you, have, you said something that touched me because it's true. It's not always that I was like that. In the first years of the business, when I when things went shit, I felt shitty. I didn't sleep at nights. I cried. I screamed. I had a relationship that oh, that was very hurting. It, it ended probably because of a lot uh, a, a lot of that. So it's not all the fun stuff, and that's what I'm saying. The the solutions to not get there is implementing the stuff that I said that sounds like fortune cookies. Because the other side, and that's why it was important for me to say it, because it's not like. Oh, since I've started, I knew all these things and never let anything get by me. No, a lot of things. I used to yell a lot. I had to go and work with people to calm myself down. And one thing that helped me calm down was breath work. Wow. Journaling, even until this day, it's hard for me to do. Like what you're doing, I have respect for you. Still hard for me. I do it meditation and I tell myself my journaling. Mm. But it's extremely important. And I think in the early stages, that's why I said perseverance. And perseverance is understanding, hey, shit is inevitable. Hmm. It's how much we can cope it and how much do we not let it consume you. And books are important. You know, it's there is a great sign, there is a great futuristic, he, that's how they call himself. His name is Alvin Toffler. And he has one word that stuck with me in the past two years. And in the sentence, which is a longer sentence, but I'll say that the three main component is, in the new workplace and where the world is going, everything is going to be unlearn, relearn, uh, sorry, learn, unlearn, relearn. So everything you've learned, you need to unlearn, and everything after you unlearn, you need to relearn it again. There is no more, hey, I know one thing and I can keep like that. So if you go with that notion, and that's what stuck with me, that at least try. And if you hear people telling you, this works for them, give it a shot. It might not work for you, but give it a shot. Because yeah, you that's might wild. Yeah. And that's you might wild. Have those profound moments while trying it. And that comes from a person that if you saw me five years ago and you told me and you told me, hey, let's meditate, I would laugh at your face. Being truly honest. I did. I thought it's all woohoo and it's such one. It took me years to open myself up. But I, I just it's it's not for me, right? Like that's yes, the typical because, excuse here. Yeah, because it was my conditioning. It was yeah. that it didn't come from my parents. We didn't talk about so much of our feelings at home. Mm. It wasn't from the upbringing. It's like the survival and the Jewish and you have to be survival and you're an immigrant. Even with your military training too, I'm sure exactly. that kicked in. Yeah. Exactly. The secrecy. Yeah. 
And then the immigrant and all these blockers that I've had to deal with as a founder, as a first time founder, when I started, it was very hard. And that's why I said first thing mentors. They well, really- let's speak to that real quick, because I also know like that was a big problem for me. And I always asked Seth, like, you know, Seth was back in Pakistan and, and, and he was amazing there. It's like, hey, man, there's a this is interesting. This, there's this paradigm shift where you're like, am I am I more indian am i more american like mm-hmm. where do you assimilate with and it's so interesting that you brought up something it was like five years ago you would have been like woo woo but now you're like okay i get it do you feel bad because i know when i try and talk to my own parents they're just like it's just such a staunch like no we're from the middle east as well like you know born, born and raised and, and my whole family's back there and they're like listen we don't talk about feelings because it's stupid it doesn't make any sense and now i'm at a point where i'm like it's not a place of pity or, or, or like, I just feel bad. I I know I can't do that, but like, then again, do you take a step back and you're like, wow, like that was really hard. And I can't talk to my own family about it because that vulnerability chasm, like you can't be vulnerable to them because they might just be like, well, maybe your mother, but a lot of maybe, you know, Seth or or, or other people out there who are listening, who are like, man, I can't go to my parents. I can't go to my family. I can't go to my extended family and be like, Hey, I'm depressed. I'm depressed. I think that also like we we kind of hit on that early on, right? Where you you mentioned like actually families can be a blocker in that case. I didn't so, share I didn't share any of my struggles through the years with my family. Interesting. You know? wow. I, I couldn't grasp. I I knew what they're gonna tell me. I knew that it's not what I wanted to hear. And family is the biggest dream killer because if I shared every oh my mom said would say come back to Israel everything is okay here. You have a home. You have a this. You have a that. All the things that you don't want to hear, but then you start thinking about them. So I don't think family is the, is the great place to go. And you know, Raj, to what you said last year, and I'm being very open about it here, I realized that I felt sometimes that now I feel sometimes stranger to my family because I've opened up so much within my own personality and with my own friends and getting to very deeper conversations that sometimes I can bring it to my family. As the, mm-hmm. as the famous word, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. And there, <laughs> and, and, and there is a reason for it. I learned to not judge them as I used to. I learned to not try to change them as I used to. As always, oh, be more like me. I learned to now accept them and show compassion, understanding where they come from and what they had to do in order to provide us the life that we have. And I should just show compassion to it. But I don't try to change it because I know I can't. And it, if I try, it will drive me crazy. I've tried that so many times. But scratch it even more. Scratch it it's just one more, one more, if you don't mind. Because then it gets to a point where maybe they even project a certain resentment. Yep. Oh, now Lior knows all the things and he's happy because he's like, I've actually seen negativity come from family members of like, Lior was, oh, and I'm projecting, Lior or Raj was always the fuck up. Like, I can always like, oh man, look at the, and then you get to a point where you're okay with yourself and the self-love comes full circle and they almost take it like, why can't I do that? No, no, no. I don't want to look at, no, no, no. Back to him, back to him. I'm mad. And they don't have that punching bag type thing. So you're like, it almost makes it really, really, really skewed. Yep. And I can tell you that I haven't had those experiences uh, as well. While starting or after selling, there's a thing that after exit, you have a, a thing with, with family as well. Uh, and family is is an issue to the, to, to the father. It's, it's an issue for it because... I was the black sheep of my family. No one thought I would be meant for nothing. All of a sudden, I'm successful. Yeah. I'm more, I'm more than this, more than that. And the, the the relationship started changing, and started changing for some things that I like and some things that I really don't like. And we, no need to speak about it more because then we're getting to personal stuff. But there is a sense of family. Is that's why I didn't say parents. I said family. Yeah. Or the, dream killers and that include brothers siblings parents aunts and uncles that includes everything for example i know many founders that have done much larger exits than i do and i i mean i'm very very happy with what i've done but then done much more and for example you get a billion dollar exit and your family really thinks that you got the billion dollar in your bank account no. Now go explain to them that you had five percent. Yes, it's thirty million dollar, but it's not one billion. Yeah. Uh, all those things all of a sudden take different effects, and people don't think about them. That's why they always say, 
when you raise, you do it for your business, you do it for your team, you do it for, when you exit is the first time when the founders think about their own life-changing events. Mm -hmm. You have to think about that. And also the team, of course, I'm not saying, hey, forget your team who helped you get there. Absolutely think about them. They should be top of mind. And that's why I call them teams, team, not employees. But that's where the founder has the life changing event that they need to think about. What will that be? How will my family react? How will this? What will I need? Who will expect from me things? Who will not? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a clarifying question there, Lior? Because I love that, that you just brought that up about team versus versus employees. Um you know, everybody talk, pontificates about like we're a family, especially young founders and, and very close knit. Yeah, I know, Seth. This is like, it's hard. It's super hard because maybe it shouldn't be a family. Like you said, some family, like you still have to have the dynamic of a team and employee. Like it's a very interesting back and forth. But how do you look at it? You've obviously had your successes because a lot of people like family, they're like, no, you can't look at it as family. It's a team. You guys are, are you figuring it out? But even in number one employee, if it's the wrong butt in the wrong seat and it's a detriment to the other 900 employees. Yeah. And that's why I always believe in the statement of hire slow, fire fast. And we can go, go into it of what it means and why, and why I believe it. And I mean, it's not, I'm not taking credit for that statement. Yeah, I, yeah. The, the top, so. uh, it's, one of the hardest thing of being a founder is the hiring, and most important is, is the is the firing. Is to let people go and to realize with yourself, hey, that was a bad person. I, sh I knew I shouldn't have gone, shouldn't have got that person. And you you can know much more in advance that people tend tend to think. It's when I think about it in my earlier days, I didn't know how to cope with it well. It it took. Uh -huh. It took trial and error. It took trial and error about hiring, how you treat the team. Do you treat everyone the same? Do you treat them differently? Until you realize that everyone is completely different and people get treated differently. And that's how, just like you, me, and and, and Seth here are different. It's the same thing if we were in a company. We need to talk in different ways. What might make more easier for me to, to digest is not easier. Where I might need less words and know how to read between the line, he might not. That just took trial and error to learn how to do. But I don't believe in a family, as you said. Yes, I, it is a family, but not in the family that we think of the conditioned family. It's not. Because if you lay somebody off, you don't lay a family member for not doing good in school, right? You don't say to your kid, oh, off you go, you didn't do good in school. I mean, maybe some, but it's not a common thing so it's a family but not a family in the sense of like what we're used to a family when i think about family i think about a community a strong community of people who are together that build a one living organism when they all come together so i look at organizations as a one living organism and that's why for me it's easier to think about a team than employees because how can they be employees if we're all as one so I grew my businesses completely bootstrapped. Yeah, I never seek fundraising. I've worked with hundreds of VCs and hundreds of startups helping them either invest or fundraise. So I've seen it many more. I, we didn't want it for our companies because we want to control our own growth and we believe that we can do it as a service business nice. bootstrapped. Nice. But I think it all comes down to to not get into it and really have your team as a living organism is the higher slow fire fast. And something I explain to founders all the time. When you hire somebody, anybody, when you hire them, you get X amount of feeling. You can, you know what you know. There is a amount of interviews. Even if you do three or you do 20, you just know as, as much as you can know in the interview. You find a whole lot of things out of it. After 30 days, that person becomes way more clear. Not many people stop in that 30 day mark and ask themselves that very specific question with the information that I know today, would I have hired that person? That's wild. And if the answer is yes, go to that person and tell them they're doing great and you're super happy with them. People need to hear it because again, we're one living organism. We're family. And if, if the answer is a no, go right in there and let that person go because that's not going to change. How many times have you heard founders telling you, you know, I wish I never hired that person. I knew it's not going to work, but yet I continue. And what happens? 
only the opposite. One, you lose credibility with your other team because they know that person should be gone, but they look up to you and you're not doing any changes. You know that the person needs to be gone and you're letting the, your ego get in the way instead of having the person that you do need there. So it's like you're you're almost shooting your feet twice, not once. And that's where it's, you hire slow, so you really see who you hire. And then you do that exercise in the 30 day and you make the changes. And it's not many people like to speak about it. It's a horrible subject. I speak about it in half of the podcasts I participate because not many people speak about it enough. But it's true. You Then you don't get to those people that you need to have that traction with. The culture and the DNA, that's how you really create the culture. And they say, I, I, like, I work with many in the early stages. The first 20 people will make the DNA for the, com- for the company for the 200 that will come next. The first 20, they're the most important. And if you don't do that extra work in the first 20, there's going to be fraction. I was about to say, no, fuck that. Fuck the DNA. Like, it actually gets to a point of resentment. It gets to a point, like I remember, and listen, you were a hundred percent right. I put my emotions and I unfortunately, and Seth probably knows it better than most. Like I'm an emotional kid. Like if there's some, somebody who's working with me or like we had a young lady and I was like, man, she's awesome. And then she's given me so much. And in the first 30 days, I'm like, oh God. And then 90 days later, I was still like this deep seated. I didn't want to admit it, but like in my, in my toes, I had resentment. I just, and, and then it, and it changed here. And then we removed that person. And within like seven days, we had done more than we had done in seven months. Yep. I yep. hate to say it. And it's true every time. And when you, and thank you so much for saying it and bringing it up because I've had the same experience of the sending one. I let somebody go to children be there. All of a sudden, wow. Boom, oh, boom, 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 boom. Executing. And it's every single time. It's factual. There is no one can argue it because people who shouldn't be there are the worst. And you're doing a dishonest to them as well because yeah. they're better suited somewhere else and it's not there. So you're doing them a service as well. Seth, we have to do a whole thing on what he's talking about. Yeah. We really do because it's wildly important, especially in the beginning. You think, okay, here's my friend. Here's my this. Here's my that. And then some people are like, hey, I'm looking for a co-founder on LinkedIn. You're like, what is this person doing? And you're like, oh, wait, that might be the best way to do it, to be honest. I think there's a lot of these guys when they talk about, you know, these mortality events, it comes from just having the wrong butts in the wrong seat or the wrong butts in the right seat, even like, oh, here's my this person. Like they've got to be they have all this background and 20 years worth of whatever. You're like, great. There's 20 worth of 20 years worth of execution with an infrastructure. How about when you don't have shit and you're doing bubble gum and, and duct tape to figure it out? Yep. And it's you said it the best. It is the right person in the wrong seat or the right seat with the wrong person. It's always the best. It's always the same. So, Leo, a quick question for you about like, so the co-founder, like finding a co-founder, right? Like switching a little gears. The general consensus is that you're uh, the best co-founder you could find is somebody that you work with in the past who, you know, who you mesh well with or, you know, you've been best friends growing up and blah, blah. On the flip side, let's say you you don't have access to people who can believe in the vision like you and you're thinking about branching it out. A lot of early stage VCs or even like startup founders will say, oh, you know, finding a random co-founder like that isn't a good idea. Like, I'd love to get your take on that. And, and, and I think it's a, I mainly agree with the, with, with the sentiment, but not totally. I don't think be, best friends are always, yes, it's always best for a best friend. I had a company with my best friend. It didn't work. We still love each other to death. He's still my best friend. It didn't work. <laughs> I found my other co-founder who I love to death and we've grown our business and we exited and we've met through a mutual acquaintance and we became friends, just like my new co-founder, my, my, my new co-founder from, from what, I'm, what I'm doing, that young introduce, for example, somebody I'm going to do in business. So I definitely think that it's always best to get a co-founder from your network. And it doesn't have to be a direct friend. It can be a friend of a friend, but somebody that you connected to. Not somebody who your investors pushed on or somebody else just introduced you. You have to have the connection with. Uh, I don't believe, and I agree with what you've heard, and there is a consensus, going out and finding co-founder in LinkedIn, not the right approach. Mm-hmm. Not the right approach unless you're willing. Usually you don't have the time to wait for long, but if you were willing to give it a year to interview, to get to know a, per, a person, if you like somebody to start going after drinks with him, dinners, maybe take a trip somewhere and see how that feels because it's a marriage. 
partnership is a marriage. And it's really, yes, in almost every startup, at some point a founder leaves, whether if it's from a good place or a bad place. In almost everyone, there is three or more founders. Almost always happens statistically. Mm. But it's always makes, for example, people who are from here, they have their colleges networking. And a lot of founders that I see are finding other other founder, other co-founders through their college networking or through the, you know, the y, YC is famous for us or Techstars mm-hmm. or whatever. For immigrants, it's a bit, for immigrant founders that are more, it's a bit harder. But even for them, it's networking events that they can meet other people. It's even in their home countries, meeting other people. Mm-hmm. And you don't always have to find somebody that shares the vision with you from day one. You you need somebody who's excited enough about the problem that you're facing, not about your solution, about the problem that the company is trying to solve in. And that's where I would look for more when I explain other founders that I work with when they look for other co-founders. The person doesn't have to believe exactly in your vision. That's why you started the company alone. Unless you started two friends or three friends like, and you started the vision together. But if you as a solo founder, accept that the person you're going to find is not going to understand the vision just like you. It takes time to see it in your eyes. But they need to love the problem that they're going to. And if they love the problem enough, that leads to an easier conversation to start working and start developing that relationship and start working about why is it your vision and why are you set to do it? You know, they always tell you, start with the why. It's true. I call it a vision. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Raj, any other questions before we dive back into story mode? No, I'm sorry. I just like, damn it. (laughs) Can we just be friends? Yeah. Can can we just be friends in general? Can we hang out? Like, sorry. (laughs) I just want to hang out. That's all all I got. That's all I got, Seth. Because because I feel like I'm so crazy. I felt like, I, I felt like, so Leo, there's radical transparency. I'm 162 days of sobriety. Um, and like, I have moved into like a completely different paradigm of like, whoa, whoa. And then when I had that clarity and and, don't put like self-love, man, like the imposter syndrome, it shut the fuck up. It is like, no, man, I'm here for a reason. I'm at the table for a reason. I made this happen. Nobody opened the door for me. They shut the door in my face. I climbed the gutters to get to that third floor window. So like, I think that's wildly important for founders just to know they can tap into that, but it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. And I'd probably hit as low as it come to get to that point of trajectory of moving up. And, you know, you don't want that for people, but you kind of have to have it. So, I mean, everything that you've been saying is just so interesting and, and very refreshing because I think Seth and I are lucky enough to have these conversations with each other. We just are like the other day, I'm like, man, this fucking sucks arguing with my wife my kids won't talk to me and like again i can't compartmentalize those i could lie to you like no i'm so good i wake up and i do my morning routine and i i drink my my collard greens and then i have my cold shower no i get up and i'm like i could drink some whiskey and just go right back to bed or i can get so like that's kind of like i i just want to honor that and and show that like hey man it's it's you've done a lot of work and excited to hear what it then again leads into Seth. So I should fuck up. And if you saw, <laughs> and I took a big breath because I was really feeling and then, and I'm receiving everything you've just uh, said. I, those, and, and I agree with you. You do, I've had to be in the lowest of the lowest to get there, whether if it was in my personal relationship and I got divorced, that brought me to, to my lowest lows and started there. And then in my next relationship, I had a load that brought me more and more up. So I agree with you. You have to, what I call, it sounds horrible, but please, for the people that are listening, understand that I'm not actually meaning what I'm meaning and hopefully they can understand between the lines. You have to die small death in yeah, order yeah. small rebirths. Yeah. Your so I, the initiation <laughs> to the next step of your life is actually the death of something else. Completely. Completely. I, I couldn't agree more. Completely. And, and you it's can't like, like, bump without having it. it. It just doesn't work. And then everyone's like, oh, I want to go back to who I was. I know. I, no, I want to learn from that death and that initiation and rebirth. Like, again, sorry, Seth. Oh, God, I just went. Learn, I learn, I, relearn. That's why it's always in my mind, literally. And it's funny, like, I keep putting these glasses on. It's like, so you learn without these glasses and you're, and the script you had was like, okay, my parents' words, okay, society's words, okay, whatever. And then you like unlearn it and you're like, oh man, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you relearn something new that you want to. It is a scientific term. Yeah, trust me. I went. I, I'm. I'm a math. Ma I'm a mathematician. <laughs> Love it. Sorry, <laughs> Seth. Can you get us back on track, please? <laughs> All right, so we were. Like, at, he, doesn't, like, he doesn't even know how he's like. <laughs> so we're talking about pigs. Ah, oh, Jesus, guys. I have a rough estimate. So I think we were at like 21, 22. <laughs> you had done your short stints around like Europe and Asia, and then now you're in the US. And then what happened? <laughs> and then I started my actual career. Yeah. This must be the, the most interesting intro ever in my life and the most interesting one. So. <laughs> Actually, that's it. We're done. It was just a one long ass intro. Taking us on that road trip. Love it. Uh, so we're said 21. Moved to the States uh, as an immigrant. I came with like 2,000 bucks. Uh, and, you know, you hear it a lot. I, 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 you know, I had maybe 2,020 something dollars, but literally that's what I had in cash. Uh, and I came and I was supposed to work in real estate. That's the only thing I could find moving. I wanted to have some sort of security. Yeah. So I get moved, started in real estate. Let me tell you, if you want to work in real estate for everybody out there, learn the damn city before you start working in real estate in the city <laughs> you've never been in before. It's a huge recommendation. I tried to rent and sell houses to people without understanding anywhere I was. People were asking me, what cool restaurants are there? And I was like, I don't know. What subway station? I don't know. I'm like, have you lived here? No. <laughs> so after two, two and a half weeks, I left, realized that you have to invest money for advertisement and listings in order to make money. It wasn't for me. It was so downgrading my technology capabilities. I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> and then after like a few weeks of not knowing what to do and like being on the verge, hey, do I need to go back? Like I'm running out of money. Uh, I found through the friend that I came to live with. So thankfully, my best friend lived there. So I moved to stay with him. And bless his soul that he let me stay with him. And really, he is a big reason of why I could make it here. And he provided me the, the ground floor to really come here and feel some sort of security, which I understand doesn't happen too many. And I was very fortunate to have it to myself, yeah. uh, something I didn't have in many other countries that I live in. I worked as a barista, so he helped me find a barista. They were paying under the table. That's the only thing I could find for the year and a half I worked as a, as a barista making coffees. I used to do it in, in earlier in life, so I kind of knew how to make latte art. People loved it. <laughs> I was teaching everybody. Uh, and then after a year and a half, the same friend uh, introduced me to a, one of their clients. They had an IT company, so one of their clients who worked in security system was a security consultant. Was willing to was looking for somebody uh, to do dispatching for them, dispatching and inventory management. Something that I the inventory management I knew a little bit from the military, and I said I'll take anything that has to do with something security by now. So I moved there, and he took a risk on me, a risk that I never did to anybody, and uh, I still find him. He's still one of my greatest mentors until this day. And it took a huge risk of me hiring me legally. Uh, and the four, I worked for, uh, with them for four years. Those was the best four years of my life. That was my finishing my college degree, doing MBA, doing PhD, all in business. I stayed with him on to midnight every single day. And he let me do every single position in the company. We went over income statements, balance sheets. Why are we paying this, this vendor's oh, that salary? No, hold on. No, no <sighs> bullshit. How and why? No, honestly, why? And I'll tell you why and how. One, we had such a connection from the get go. Okay. Similar upbringings. He he saw me as like a small son for him. Really, I don't know what where in his past I hit a spot, but I you guess did. you did. I, I hit it. I, I definitely hit the spot, but I was also willing to give for myself so he took it it does it's not all fun and games he took extreme advantage of me i got paid like shit i worked like a horse yep. yeah i was treated like shit but he would still show it to me he would yell at me for not understanding the income statement the first time he would show me but he was still showing it to me yep. so it's not all fun and games but he did i touch a space a spot for him for him and his wife that were both in the business and they let me run it and we worked with, there we worked with companies like 
a lot of Fortune 500 companies, the Google offices, the Facebook offices, all the WeWork buildings, startups, hedge funds, and all the all the rest. And we did. We're talking physical security. No security systems like surveillance system, biometric, facial recognition, and no, no, all... that's no, that's what. But like, like fob, not like actual, but like, uh, like yeah, fobs, analytics, yeah. Okay. This and networks and infrastructures. Oh, so, also IT security. Okay. Wow. And that's where I developed my true passion for startups and VCs. I loved helping the small become large. As you now know a little bit, my upbringing, you can guess why. The, I did not like to help the very large stay large. I hated bureaucracy. It, it's not for me. I'm I'm also quite a horrible employee. I mean, that's a true entrepreneur, a horrible employee, because I judge all the status quo. And that's true entrepreneurship. We can be any place. But I... After I finished there, I started my first business in the U.S. and I joined an existing business uh, and I joined as a partner to do the sales, to do the sales for to bring more business, brought some business. And then I wanted to move to California. The partners didn't really want to open in California. They were willing to attend it. And once I moved, I got a few clients here. And then they kind of didn't want to support them. There was like a tension between the people wanting to support the New York clients and not here. I sold my shirt. That was my first exit in life. I mean, 20, 20 to $25,000. I felt like I became a millionaire that day. Yeah, uh, It was meaningful to me as I never had that type of money in one time uh, in, in my hand. And then I wanted to start and see how it's done in California here, see how it's done on a huge scale on what does it take from like a service business for an American business that's been here for like a hundred years. And I started working with uh, another security implementer called All Guard. They do alarm systems, fire alarm, and ev- networks, infrastructures, uh, and everything in between. And I worked there for a year and a half while meeting my other co-founder, Will, who we created Sentin during that time. Oh. I created Sentin during that time, got a few clients, the same clients that I've met when with the other company, started moving over and getting more and more client until they, I realized that half of the time I was not uh, really involved in the work and I got fired. It was the first time in life I got fired and it felt so good. I in, it, When I got fired, I told him, thank you for doing it. I would probably not have the balls to do it. And the reason for the security was still there. I was afraid, like everyone is afraid to make that leap. And he kind of understood and he understood uh, as an entrepreneur himself, he understood that I'm not really putting my attention there and I'm doing something on the side. He didn't know what it was. Then I told him, and we're still in touch uh, here and there. Uh, and I went on full time to start Sentent. Uh, my partner was still working at another startup. He joined about a year and a half later full time after we really built the ground running. And the first year, my first year at my business, we I made $16,000. That was a beautiful, amazing salary that one could really survive by. But then the second year, third year, and continuing and uh, not giving up and knocking on doors and cultivating my differences and why I'm different from any other IT security and compliance company startups can work with, really developing that language and then getting two partners that really helped us get a whole lot of businesses. And then we started growing two, 300% year over year growth. And in 2022, in August, we got acquired. Uh, We were uh, over $5 million in revenue, 200% year over year growth, twice in 5,000 winner in the the top thousands, in the the top Mm 1,000. And and, uh, with uh, 42 employees and a 72 ENPS score, uh, for the people who don't know it here, it's an employee net promoter score pretty much shows if you ask your employees how likely are they to refer you to their to a friend or a colleague and then make the numbers and uh, that's so, my let me let me just push back on one thing so you talked about 16,000 the first year deep down in your bones is it hey i had more grit and i didn't fold up shop and i i missed those mortality events to the next one or did you have a uvp that was so out there that you knew it was going to hit because I think there's a lot of founders. It's 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 just, it's a the double edged sword. I, as I mentioned, I have a friend, and he's he's 14 years into his company. It's a coffee company, and he's doing great. And I'm like, but it's been kind of like whatever. And he's like, no, nah, man, like I don't quit. I don't quit. I don't quit. I was like, hey, listen, I get it. 
what the fuck are you doing? It's been 14 years of the $16,000 salary. Like at some point there's gotta be that, or are you just like, nope, you just, and then, cause you mentioned, you know, hire slow, fire fast, that whole thing. So were you very much believing in your, in an actual value prop that was different to somebody else? Or are you like, no, man, we just have the tenacity and grit to keep knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. Oh, in the beginning, the first year, we, when we created the business, we knew that we're not creating it for a lifestyle business. It's something that I help founder. That's mainly in a certain, in a service type of business, not startup. Speak to that. What do you mean by lifestyle business? So people know. When you start a service business, not a startup, it's very different because startup, you, you usually start to either get acquired or become public when the company yep. you up, you're becoming in some ways. Yep. Service business, you, it's extremely important from the outset to make a decision. What's the business strategy of it? Is it going to be a lifestyle business, meaning a business that we keep for life and we enjoy the dividends out of it, the salaries, like sounds like a lot like your friend, or are we growing it to an exit we know that we're growing it to get acquired at some point we knew that we wanted if we were going to grow it we were going to grow it to an exit however in the beginning the first year all we wanted was like if we can make the same salary that we make elsewhere that's all we want i made sixteen thousand for the year not a month yeah so i definitely didn't hit my mouse <laughs> of making the, the same salary but i saved some previously i saved a little bit so i was willing to take the risk for a year Okay, I said to myself, I'm willing to risk a year of my life to try it. After a year, I saw that we've grown in revenue. We, yes, we made EBITDA 16,000, but we've grown in revenue. I'm starting to get more and more people talking to me. I'm believing in what we do. I'm believing in my capabilities to do it. So then I did a contract with myself another year. Let's try an, a, another year. Literally, then the second year was the year where it became a business that he was able to join full time, that we've hired our first full time hire, and that we took it on. But that was from saying to myself, hey, another year, because he was not willing to quit yet his job very rightfully. And I was willing to, to take that risk. But he, so, yes, it's a lot of belief, but also seeing what's there factually because you can have a whole lot of beliefs and get a rude awakening slap it's like yeah you can believe all day no but i said that there is traction i said that i'm doing i'm knocking on doors and people are talking to me that if i do more of it i was strategizing and making literally financial models if i get these clients and if i do how many clients do i need to get to sustain just me for now yeah but that shit is so far and few between because everyone is i'm on the five yard line I, we're right there it's you have to do it until you can't yeah literally like ah man that's a bummer that's such a bummer and i, I wish there was just that 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 thing where you'd be like, cool yeah like i saw the traction okay was there a criteria to say that that's actual traction or i'm in, in the echo chamber in my head and i'm manifesting no 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 i i know for a fact if this if this one thing happens and you're like really you're gonna have one thing that happens that changes the entire trajectory of your business no but question the, mark yeah the one thing that happens for our company was clients I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, if we get this one partnership, you're like, no, like one partnership shouldn't be the enough. delta. Yeah. So one is not enough. It was, uh, if I get in the beginning, so in the first year, I was able to get a company every quarter. Okay. Every quarter. In the, the end of the year, I started seeing it that, like in December, I got one and in January, another one wanted to close. I said, okay, what if I turn it into one a month? A month. Yes. Then started going. All of a sudden, I found myself in three, two months, six yeah. a month. That's yeah. when I, only when we got to about three clients closing in a month, that's when I made that my first hire. Until then, we had a contractor and me and my partner did everything. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Conveniently. <laughs> and that's where Bootstrap, that's why we took the risk of Bootstrap. I didn't have an investor or a loan that was on my shoulders that I needed to repay. And somebody's telling me that I need to 10X. And that's where I always believe in. If you don't have to go, even for startups, don't run to the equity and price rounds. Don't run it there. Try to use angels. Try to use family and friends. Try to bootstrap as much as you can. Get yourself ready so when you do go to the price round or when you do go to get an investment, if it's a service business, they can name the price and you can name the terms, not the opposite way around. Yeah. My money, uh, your terms or... Your yeah. terms or yeah, my terms. My terms, money. your money. Yeah, <laughs> the terms are more important to the founder than the money. I always say to founders, it's better to take the smaller check with the right investor than the larger. Oh yes, investor. Yeah. That's what we're doing right now. We're trying to retire a bunch of follow-on because we don't want them. 
We yep. want to have others following this probably better. And so they're like, well, let's close. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to one and I don't need to. So fuck off. Yep. So I think in every business that it becomes more, more invisible depending on the business. Yeah. So for example, if we're talking about young and what in his pool company, if he knows that if he get the truck while the truck gets profitable, he can do another one, for example, or many other business. So I think each person that if you're a founder, you need to know your business. And if you don't know your business, that's the first problem. If you don't know your numbers and what you need to get to get you to a growth trajectory, you have a problem. Then you shouldn't probably run businesses and you should go and work for somebody else. And you can be in strategic roles and whatever it is, but you don't have to run. There is a lot of unknowns, but you have to have actionable and you have to be able to quantify those actions that you're taking. Like I didn't know in the beginning how many times I'll go to knock on doors, how many clients I'll get. It's not quantifiable. I can't quantify that. Okay. But I was starting to see that if I do that more and more and more and more, I'm starting to spread seeds and those seeds are coming. Now, until this day, I can't tell you how long it takes from when I sprout the seed until when I get the client. Okay. I, because it's not quantifiable. It's hard to know. So I can quantify other things. How many clients I get per month? What is the MRR? that I want to get from those clients? What's the AR that I want to be? What do I want to be in EBITDA with my gross margin? All those things we thought about. Yeah. And that's what we're able to, to tell me and him, and, and I'm very thankful to my partner at the time because he knew more the American system than I knew. So he helped, helped with the business side on the taxes and the legal, all the stuff like how do we register? And he said, I didn't know that. I, I learned it as I go. We both learned it as we go. Like who knew how to hire? Like how to make a requisition. Okay. We could barely make a resume for ourselves. Now making a requisition for others. But it's trial and error and you try it. And we saw everything as a learning experience. And when you look at it from that, even the hard time and you see, hey, it's a learning, it's a part of it. And even if it will go to shit, mm -hmm. and that's where it says failure is a part of it. And yeah. I love failure because you can't have success without failure. And we always told ourselves, if it goes to shit, we've learned so much and it's life valuable lessons that we'll always take with us. And that kept me going. That notion that no matter what happened, I'll learn from it and it will help me with my next business. That made me good. continue. Yeah. So that's something I recommend every founder to continue reminding themselves that it's all learning experiences. Wow. Back from a quick bathroom break and ended on like a, a really... Just again, I, I keep using the word profound because I don't think there's any anything else, uh, any other way to describe it. But um, you, as part of your story, right? You you honed a little about so August 2022, you sold the company, and now like you've been, you alluded to it earlier, where you know founders when they sell the company, they have to learn or or unlearn or you know kind of plan accordingly right plan for this new phase of, of their lives what how how has life been for you post exit like where's your head at you've been thinking about doing all these other businesses and, and you are starting a, or co-founding a couple of them like talk to us a little more about that thought process and where you are today please yep. and i'm glad you asked it in that way because i do think it's very personal so i can speak about it to what i do and every founder is very different for them i think uh, for me the m a phase was truly hard. I was probably at my lowest uh, and my highest at the same time. Because it's the time that you realize, hey, you're letting the baby that you love so much go out of your hands. But on the other side of it, you're making a huge life experience that you've dreamt of all your life. So that, that notion was hard hard for me and whether if it's you know in my therapy session with my therapist and i'm not trying to say that i think more people should hear it and people should see it. I think that's an amazing thing and helped me she helped me a lot during that process and my partner helped me and me and my cohort talking about it authentically of how we're feeling about it and the hard parts and the, the happy parts of it when i when we sold fully, I, I, I let it go. I emotionally let it go, not from caring about it. I care. I'm still there. I care so much of the way, but letting go that I do not own it anymore. Mm -hmm. I During that, I also had a huge realization during my personal development, as we talked earlier about, that everything I've built up to that point was from survival because of my low socioeconomic class, because of my upbringing, because of, we can go on and on. 
but that I've done it for my survival. I needed that business. It was a do or die. It was really it was. And now I'm in a different place in my life that I want to do things from experience. That I want to not. It's not like I did it in joy, but I want to do things from the experience of the relearning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've started giving back, just like my mentors. I've my mentors have never asked me for a single thing. They're only asking one thing in return: that when I have a success, I'll pass the wisdom on. And I think that was the best, most profound, we talked about profound a lot, most profound request that they could have made because that's what I'm doing now. So I'm paying it forward. I'm talking to so many founders on a weekly basis, helping their struggles, helping with their successes, or just making strategic introductions or connections. Uh, So a lot of giving back. I've realized that because I'm an immigrant and lived in so many different countries, I have a huge passion to support immigrants. Uh, founders i think the country that we're living in the united states started by immigrants uh, every, everyone here is an immigrant whether if you're an eighth generation or an generation, unless you're native american which has a profound sense by itself and i support many organizations that are n- native as well but immigrant founders is a close to my heart because I've been there. I've been there as a kid, so I can help the ones that have kids to what the kids are experiencing because I've experienced that as a kid. And I also know the struggles that they're going through as an adult, making a sense of belonging, making connection, making friends, but supporting with the business. So that's where I'm spending the most of my time on and my next venture is gonna be solely for immigrant founders while doing other things in the service. But for me, it was... Builders got got to build in my mind. I don't know how to stop. Many people stop and take a career break, which I think can also be very necessary. I'm still doing traveling, which I'll do. I'm transitioning out of Senten probably in the next six to eight months, something like that, uh, or maybe a bit more, but somewhere around those lines. Mm-hmm. And I will definitely have my my time off to breathe, but I like building and I like supporting others. And I get a lot from that, a lot of my gratitude and a lot of my happiness comes from helping others. And I would say, if, even if this podcast, if it helps change somebody 10%, then I've, then it's a good job on my, on my hand. I did what I needed yeah. to. So I think actually uh, just just a quick note. So when uh, Lior and I first uh, had our our introductory call, um, at the end of it, right, I, I was very transparent. Like, hey, we're a small show. We're doing it just for fun right now. It's not a commercial or anything. And it was like, hey, I don't care, man. As long as if we can help even one person, right, it's worth it. And again, like that was very helpful for our own perspective. I feel like where. You know, sometimes we get bogged down like, hey, I got other things I need to do, you know, other startups and blah, blah, blah. And, and where I think entrepreneurs eventually well, your second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever company, you understand the the importance of focus. Um, right. And then being able to kind of like take that focus from something that you have to do in your company or with your family or all these other responsibilities and then do something like this for fun. Um, you know, that, that was a, an awesome reminder. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, thank you for, for kind of reminding us. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. So that's, it's, it's a lot about giving back. My biggest passion in life is to connect people. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to steal Nokia's slogan of connecting people. And I wish I could, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to steal it and hopefully I'll get sued by them. I'll get big enough <laughs> that they want to sue me. That's all, <laughs> what one could hope for. But it truly speaks, you know, a huge magnitude to me when I say it. Uh, I like to see different cultures bridge. And that's why I want to help immigrant founders in a sense of everywhere. It's not just Israeli because I'm from Israel. It's from everywhere because I want to see connection of bridges. I, on my spare time, I mentor young entrepreneurs in middle schools from low and higher socioeconomic classes and starting kind of a small nonprofit organization to bring those two together uh, under social inclusion and helping them understand entrepreneurship more, something that I wish that I had as a kid. Uh, so now I'm doing things that make me happy and helping others. And that's, you know, I got it probably from my mom. She's the same way. Uh, we talked about her. I'll talk about her again. She married like 30 couples, I think, if it's something like that. Wow. <laughs> it, it, we, I, have, I have it in my blood to help others and I'm enjoying it. So that's uh, the next phases. So builders got to build. Some fathers some <laughs> go straight to their next thing. Some father takes a break. I don't think there's right and wrong. It's what calls you do it. And don't think about others, what was right for them, because it was them, not you. Yeah. 
no that's that's amazing um well actually did you want to make a or mention like what you're building these days i mean you you alluded to working with a few other people on their projects right so like any interesting things that you would want to just kind of highlight like uh, what kind of companies or stuff you're interested in or, or working on for immigrant founders it's going to be a, a sort of a community a platform where they can call home away from home in a sense uh, where they can come and seek help on both of their business side of the house but more importantly and more passionately their personal side of the house uh, and that's from how do you move here and to how do you open a bank account and which schools do you should you send your kids to and what does your partner do and how do you make friends and so all those yeah. things uh, yeah. the business side you can imagine what t- t- type of help that will be but something in those lines that uh going into and uh taking part in few accelerators that work with international governments that support founders coming to a state and helping them and joining those companies to help them more advise and provide help once you make that transition. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. And then um, <clears throat> kind of, uh, we'd love to hear, like we call it the ideal founder fit. Um, what kind it, some people like to sp- play within or, or only help within certain industries or certain sizes of companies or teams. Like I'd love to hear, um, what kind of founders or uh, if their teams were listening to this episode, how would they know that they should reach out to you or if you kind of qualify um, within what you're interested in? Yep. So mainly, my interest is mainly working with CEOs or C-levels, co-founders, and working to help them navigate their expansion to the U.S. Hmm. How does that look? And also, like I said, on the business and personal side, it's both of them. I do have, you know, I think I can't say I'm sector agnostic because that will be BS, you know, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know it all and I'm not pretending to know it all. I have definitely sectors that fit more with my knowledge and that's, you know, B2B SaaS companies. I know products very well, dev tools. Of course, security and compliance, as that's where I come from. And I really under, uh, like also helping consumer businesses because I understand consumer from previous things that I've worked with. But for example, if you come to me, uh, healthcare or biotech or robotics, I probably can't help you. Where I do help some companies like that is literally like a CEO advisor, like a CEO mentorship, mm-hmm. like how to scale, how to talk to the team, how to run, how to talk to investors, how to run effective board meetings. But mainly I like to stay in the industries that I can really speak well to and can also make meaningful intros and connections to those of the people that I work with. Because if you're in the clinical trials, unfortunately, I don't have anybody to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> understood and wh- where can uh where can our viewers or listeners find you like if they wanted to connect or um just prick your brain absolutely so linkedin will be the best place to to reach out to, to me on i'm uh, usually active and that's where a lot of others find me uh, there's of course the email my first last name at gmail.com that people can uh, reach out but linkedin will be preferred awesome no we'll we'll, uh, we'll link your uh your linkedin profile at least to the the description here so people can find you um no awesome and then you you mentioned a little about like some startup communities that you're a part of and, and these groups that you're you're really trying to uh to assist um a quick shout out to them just so because i feel like a a lot of our listeners are also in that phase where they're considering a community or like an incubator and accelerator to join um, so the ones, you know, we try to try, try to connect our um, our listeners with the people that um, our guests, right, with the ones that they recommend. So any that you wanted to give a quick shout out to, please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a networking group, if if you're not just a founder, if you're an operator, I think Operators Guild is a great group out there. Uh, I truly enjoy it. It's uh, for any and all operators. You don't have to be a founder. Uh, with accelerators, that's a whole separate conversation by by, by by itself, and we can go into it. And I have a whole lot of feelings about about accelerators, but I do want to shout out to Weave Acceleration because I it's it's an accelerator that I help a lot. What I have passion to them, it's not that they're you know the best accelerator out there, but they're focusing specifically with governments. Uh, and immigrant founders moving their expansion to the U.S. I think their program is spot on. They have amazing connections. 
uh, and I truly love uh, them. 500 startups, I also see them doing good work with immigrant founders. Uh, but yeah, those are the the shout outs. Uh, yeah, because I can go, I can find myself on and on, and then I'll say that the bad things about Sasan is... <laughs> That can be an episode two at some point. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I, I think as we, we go along, right, we'll probably invite all our guests again for like a six month or 12 month update and, and to kind of see if you wanted to change some of your, your philosophies. Um, but hey, this was so much fun, Lior. Um, uh, wow. Like, I'm excited to be able to like kind of dissect this episode, create some highlights around it and share it with the community. But Raj, did you have any other questions or any party? <laughs> I mean, I guess you didn't do terrible. I don't know. <laughs> Leo, I always like to ask, and I unfortunately do have a, another meeting. Percentage wise, <clears throat> Guy Raz, how I built this luck versus hard work. Mm. Hard work. It, Seth, it's so funny. They're all, oh, everyone's like, 80 20. No, fuck you. Yeah, you absolutely know. You're like, dude, it's 9,000% hard work and maybe one iota of, of luck. It is, but if I had to say, I do, I, I want to say 80 20, I'll actually do 90 10. 90% 90 yeah. hard work, 10% luck. Awesome. I've seen very lucky people that couldn't grow shit because they didn't do the work it took to grow it. Yeah. And I see a lot of, and you also see people who have grown and did a lot of hard work, but it's not just hard work. So I think, you know, to challenge you back, it's work smart, not just work hard. There is smart work in the hard work. Uh, You work very hard, but very stupidly. So I think, yes, it's hard work. It's a dedication and very small amount of luck. It's there, but a very small amount as I see it. And the smart work sets you up for being lucky. And if anybody doubts that, Read a book called Outliers. That's a great Gladwell. one. Gladwell is my dude. Yep. And, and I haven't read that. will break that misconception about luck, about all these people that we think that are luck, and luck has nothing that's to do. A, that's a great, great point. Awesome. Yep. Well, hey, this was this was so much fun. Uh, uh amazing value to all our listeners. I'm I'm thank you again, young. When you hear no, this, I was about uh, to say fucking hate that. I was like, oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, young. <laughs> you weren't you weren't lying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any good things about him during this show? Dude. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, he doesn't listen. Yeah. Event no, like we got through all the positive stuff. Like maybe we should end it before we start talking shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 no, thank but, you for your time, brother. Yeah. Uh, hey. Appreciate both of your time. Thank you for having me. I super enjoyed talking to you both and getting awesome. deep and uh, to where we got, uh, which was unexpected. Love those type of conversations. So thank you. Well, and I'll pick your brain it. off to, off camera too. Anytime. Uh-huh. Thanks, brother. Amazing. Well, hey, thank you to our listeners and viewers for t- tuning in. We'll be back again next week with a brand new episode. But if, in case you need any help or we have the concierge, we're working on a few more things. Um, definitely check out the website. Reach out to us on LinkedIn, social media. Um, we're Again, we're here to help. So uh, whatever you're dealing with on the early stage startup side, chances are we have either dealt with it ourselves or know somebody who can. And that's what we're here for. So thank you. We'll see you next week. Take care.